Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am Eric Sharaev. Uh, I teach international relations. Today we will study political psychology and uh, how it is connected, how it is affecting, how it affects international relations and national politics. So far, we have studied several subjects within uh, uh, this field of international relations, realism, liberalism. Uh, we studied conflict theories and we studied feminism and Marxism and many other isms and also we apply them. Today, we will try to understand the meaning of political psychology and we'll use many examples. Not we're studying, not studying theory, we're studying some ideas that are uh, theoretical uh, based on experiment studies, but then we'll try to apply not only to events, events that took place long time ago, but also to our uh, today's, uh, today's life. So uh, uh, we will uh, start with a, a brief uh, description of political psychology, and uh, then I will explain to you how to apply this knowledge and how you can deepen, expand your knowledge of political psychology. In uh, my classes, in the classes with other professors, yourself, by reading, by studying, and during um, other lectures, I will provide many examples from the fields of political uh, psychology. So this is a field which defined in variety of ways, but essentially, if I choose the most concise definition, applying to international relations. Uh, political psychology as a field examines psychological factors of international relations. What factors? Almost anything which refers to psychology. What is psychology? It's a study, it's study of a human behavior and experience. So it's a human in the world, individuals, their feelings, their emotions, their motivation, their knowledge, their memory, their their uh, aspirations, their fears, their dreams, whatever we, we refer to our inner world is, is, is about psychology, psychology. And then this inner world is applied to the world of international relations. Some say, well, this is not we are supposed to study. We study institutions, we study the processes, but those institutions are just run by themselves. Politics, decisions that are there, just, just, just decisions that take place, just, just take place because their decisions it must be somebody, a human being, he or she, with the mind of a, uh, of a, of a transformer, with the mind of a, an individual who has ideas, visions, or doesn't have those ideas and visions. So individuals make those decisions. Uh, people around them who influence those decision makers, the public opinion, uh, the media, uh, the personal experiences in the family, everything matters. And of course, of course, so many things are beyond our scope of, uh, of understanding or beyond our scope of interest, but those individual factors that affect politics are those factors that we study and we must incorporate them in our work. Political psychology has become a field of political science uh, for several decades. It's a young branch of political science. Political psychology borrows a lot from psychology, of course, uh, from sociology, from anthropology, from cultural studies, from uh, political economy, behavioral economics in particular, and also from medicine. I'll mention about these things during this uh, brief lecture. We will look at decision making, how decisions are made by people in power. We'll look at leadership, the, those individual traits that, that uh, affect decision-making process and so, so many political processes in our society and in global world. We'll examine political behavior in general, how people vote, how, why they vote this way, how they see other nations, other countries, why they see other nations in the country, why they, they love and hate fear and, and fear-mongering and, and character attacks against, against others, uh, prejudice and stereotypes, racism. They do have psychological roots, powerful roots. And also political communication, how people transfer, transmit information that affects their political decision-making, their behavior, their judgments in politics. 
So it's a vast area, but let's narrow down our interests. And I will mention the most important highlights for you. Uh, and so repeat that to deepen your knowledge, to expand your knowledge, of course, you should read more, study more, uh, take other classes. And also you can uh, formalize your knowledge to a certain degrees in the United States and in many countries that would advance your knowledge. And so, well, uh, you get certificates uh, or minors, majors, or uh, advanced degrees in the field of political psychology. This applied field, and I'll be mentioning about the applications throughout this lecture today. Today, begin with an example. Uh, if you uh, happen to be in Stockholm, if you, if you haven't been there, please visit this wonderful, uh, beautiful capital of Sweden uh, and uh, visit uh, Vasa Museum, uh, museum that features a, a ship that sunk many years ago. Who cares about sunken ship that's well professed? political psychology, just piece of wood and then just some ropes there. Well, uh, uh, this ship was built uh, in 1600s, long time ago. The King of Sweden really, really wanted, wanted to impress Europe and the Polish King in particular by building a monster ship to show how powerful and how mighty the Sweden was. Sweden was. Well, uh, when they tried the ship, a few minutes on, on a, in a harbor, it capsized and sunk with so many people. Unfortunately, unfortunately, people died during this tragedy. But what happened? King was, was definitely uh, really, really angry. Uh, and so he demanded that system, non certain terms that the guilty parties be punished, the engineers, the, the builders, the, those designers and, and advisors who told him to build this. But in fact, we deal with a well-studied and uh, maybe one of the most well-known phenomena in psychology is groupthink. It's a psychological phenomenon that occurs within a group of people in which desire for harmony, conformity in the group results in an irrational or dysfunctional decision-making outcome. In fact, the eyewitnesses would suggest that uh, everybody around the king wanted to please him. Uh, later on, almost everybody said that project was doomed from the beginning. Just as uh, no studies of, of, of balancing, no studies of, of, of a weight of this, of the battleships. King, the king wanted to put as many, put as many guns as possible uh, on, on the boat, uh, just, just to make it heavy and, and impressive and deadly. But it was too heavy, too heavy. Uh, but seeing the problems, understanding the problems, nobody dared to challenge the king because, well, they thought about their careers. Yes, they thought about their families, on safety, security, money, promotions, and everybody zipped their lips and nobody said, your majesty, that this is, this is, this is not supposed to work. And see, it's a disaster. Well, yeah, that's something about psychology, our universal feature of many of us, if not all of us, to keep quiet, even knowing that something is going wrong. The country is going the wrong direction. This country, that country, just whatever. I used it, an, an example. And, and the people who are close to Prime Minister, President, King, Shah, will not say anything about this because, well, they have different things in mind and then want to disturb the appearing harmony in their relationship with the cabinet, uh, in the Council of Ministers, uh, among the advisors to presidents, uh, or advises to dean or CEO of a company, big company or small company. In history, there are plenty of examples. One of those most obvious US history, uh, Cuban history, history of Latin America, uh, it's one of the most teachable moments in world history. The invasion of 1961 of uh, the Bay of Peaks in Cuba. When the United States, President Kennedy, uh, used uh, the help uh, of Cuban immigrants, uh, those who opposed the new communist regime in Cuba. Uh, America trained them, instructed them, and promised to help them uh, so that they would be deployed there and uh, take over uh, the communist uh, regime, just take over the power in the country and kick out the communist regime and just restore uh, well, the previous governments of Cuba in Cuba. It, it failed, it failed. Miserably failed, people died, people captured. When uh, the insiders began to analyze this, this case, they came to conclusion that was a typical case of groupthink. In fact, 
it was named after, just to, we, we just uh, look at this case. Uh, the, uh, the CIA uh, uncritically selected presenting the facts to the president, persuading him that, uh, well, invasion could be, could be fine, could be successful. So the president didn't see the negative outcome, potential negative outcome of, of invasion. Uh, few people around president, including Kennedy, they did not uh, impartially evaluate the facts available to them. They were eager to move forward. They were eager to do something. Uh, and they ignored uh, very obvious dangers, dangers, uh, opinions or, or outcomes. And, and, and they made sure that the pe people who had those warnings will not speak directly to to president, shutting down the, the initiative to explore other options. So we do it in life all the time in our lives. You, you have the decision, you decided to do something, and then just you simply ignore uh, others. So wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you chose this college, they chose the school to transfer, but wait a minute, this is not really the right decision. I'm talking about, say, transfer policies, the decisions we make about jobs or about finding well, leaving jobs, getting jobs, applying for jobs. Here is a decision involved thousands of lives at stake and the international global affairs were at stake. Uh, remaining up too optimistic and rigid in the belief that the operation would succeed. So just basically being too optimistic. But why? A variety of reasons, but one of them also psychological, that the generals, the advisors, the uh, top intelligence officers, uh, didn't want to disrupt the dynamic of uh, dynamics of a young uh, and charismatic president. Uh, just they, they believe that so many of us believe. Oh, if if I have doubts, but other people around me don't have doubts, maybe I'm wrong. They're right. So we have, let's try it. Let's do it. Let's let's take responsibility. Maybe just just not personally, but so all of us, and then we'll see what what happens. What happens. Group thing is a phenomenon which we uh, later, all of us who dealt with this and evaluate, evaluate this in the morning, uh, we say, oh, well, we, sh we, we knew, but what were, they, we, what were we thinking? We, we knew, it, but just some, something happened and well, we, we could not uh, make a rational decision. So group thing is a phenomenon which adds to, to uh, the element of irrationality in decision-making uh, and uh, in, in action. Almost not the similar case, but talking about the prestige and, and talking about the assumptions uh, and the desire not to harm the appar apparent harmony of decision makers' process. Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Uh, just brief, brief uh, background, many of you know, just can read in, in the textbook, that the Soviet Union deployed uh, nuclear missiles uh, and they were placed in Cuba and they could reach almost every territory, uh, every uh, big city in the United States, except Seattle uh, in Hawaii, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, that was done out of many, many, many reasons, uh, political, ideological, but they were being deployed there. And uh, they assumed that uh, the, if the if, uh, United States would uh, attack Cuba con with conventional weapons, just to take over Cuba again with the use of uh, using uh, Cuban immigrants or maybe new big, big invasion. Then Cuba will retaliate with nuclear weapons against US. And then US probably retaliate against Soviet Union with nuclear weapons and the Soviet Union will retaliate against, against US with nuclear weapons again. So, uh, so having seen this and having assumed this, the United States would be deterred from attacking Cuba with the use of conventional forces. So, the, the assumption was that the America, um, Americans would not want to see this, and so that that peace will be will be will be guaranteed. Guaranteed. Well, um, uh, the world the world came uh, this close to a nuclear war, actual nuclear war. Uh, just we were lucky, probably, but also we can say that that's the course of events shows that that uh, human psychology played a role in the development of this crisis and also play a role in, uh, in uh, uh, resolutions of crisis. crisis. Uh, young uh, John Kennedy and uh, rather mature uh, uh, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, Soviet uh, prim uh, prime minister or chairman of a council of ministers. The gap between them was about 20 years. Um, 
Both were war veterans and both, as far as we know, tried to avoid deadly conflict by all means. However, both of them experienced pressure from hotheads in both governments. We should, must understand that despite ideological differences, yesterday, today, in the future, of uh, capitalist, non-capitalist, uh, uh, communist, anti-communist, uh, governments do have uh, soft heads, those who prefer to negotiate, and those hotheads, the hawks, who want to attack and, and strike first. Both presidents experienced the pressure from both sides. Both were reluctant warriors, former officers. Uh, however, pressure was enormous. Kennedy misread Soviet intentions. That was obvious. Almost everyone in America those, those days, those years, since 1940s and 50s, uh, everybody was learning that the Soviet Union was an empire which was trying to expand and, and establish communism all over the world, and intentions were to expand, expand, expand. What, it, what else do you expect from the Soviets? Of course, they want to strike and want to attack. The uh, CIA overlooked the Soviet missiles. Not deliberately, not just, well, somebody was there just and, and maliciously overlooked, no. So the culture of, of, uh, of uh, culture of uh, judgment. And it was that the Soviets are aggressives, aggressive, the aggressors. However, they don't have audacity to uh, put nuclear missiles right there, bring them to and, and, and install them uh, in Cuba. Just was impossible. There is a, well, so in the imagination, which is supposed to be a part of a mind of intelligence officer, wasn't there, wasn't there. So CIA overlooked the Soviet missiles. And also Kennedy, one of the youngest presidents of the United States. Uh, we know today it's not, did, he didn't say that, of course. It is not, who would say this just, to, just to, in your face? It's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I am young and I want to prove that I'm not too young. I am mature and tough and decisive. History of international relations, history of politics shows that younger political leaders have this conscience, conscious or not completely conscious tendency to overcompensate to show their maturity by doing something tough, something really, really uh, of, often reckless, reckless. Age matters in international relations and politics, and this is something I'll mention again uh, today. So Kennedy wanted to appear tough uh, in front of vis-a-vis -vis a, uh, a tough uh, in seasoned Soviet leader. Soviets also had problems. Khrushchev uh, underestimated Kennedy. On numerous, on some occasions, on several occasions, Khrushchev mentioned about Kennedy as a, uh, in a language that uh, can be portrayed, uh, can portray Kennedy as uh, a young guy from Massachusetts, a spoiled kid who has no experience. Yeah, he was at war. Just he was an officer, but just for for short period. Uh, just a spoiled kid. Just if you press Americans hard, they will give up. That's the mentality of many. So if you, if you just show them the fist, they will learn the language quickly. And just uh, don't be soft with them, just be tough with them. And let's do, let's bluff. Let's show them our fist. And Kennedy will definitely, definitely break down and just ask for negotiations.